Welcome everyone to our latest installment of the Cosmolex webinar series. Today's presentation will be on IELTA Trust Accounting. Today's presentation is the first in a special three-part legal accounting webinar series that Cosmolex will be conducting over the month of October to help prepare your practice for year-end and for 2017. Presenting today, we have Erica Burstler, Manager of Client Services at Cosmolex and Cosmolex Product Specialist. With that, I will hand the presentation over to Erica. Thank you so much. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So first, I do want to cover what the learning objectives are. What, what will we be covering today? Um, really, these four items, you know, what's trust accounting, top 10 pitfalls that many law firms face, proper trust account records, which is basically reporting, and how can technology help with all of this? So this is definitely a deep dive into trust accounting, which I know is a topic that not everybody likes to talk about, but it is a very important area to make sure you're well aware of how to handle your client funds for your practice. Now this next image, uh, this hopefully is not what your office looks like, but I do bet for many of you some days this is how life and client records and everything feels. Whether your office looks like this or not, you absolutely want to make sure your trust account books look nothing like this. And as we explore various items related to trust accounting, apart from my presentation slides, I will also be using our Cosmlex software to demonstrate some of these points. Cosmlex is a cloud-based legal practice management system, which is specifically designed for solo and small law firm needs. But ultimately, it's not about a particular system, whatever product you choose to use. It is about learning about the issues, how they affect your business, and potential solutions. So you want to arm yourself with knowledge as to what needs to be done, how it should be done, and what tools you can use in your firm to ensure that you're maintaining that compliance and following those regulations as well. So before we begin with specifically trust accounting, let's quickly review the typical needs of a law firm, even a small or solo firm. And that comes down to these three different factors. First is a law practice management system, which is handling your calendaring, task management, email management, document management. That's something that really every business needs, and it's more of an organizational uh, standpoint, making sure everything's organized on that matter level. Then you have a legal billing system, which covers your time and expense tracking, invoicing, collections. Uh, that, of course, is important as well. And the third is a law firm accounting system, which is what we're going to be discussing in a little further detail here. Now, for legal practice management and for billing, there are several choices depending upon your needs. There are many practice management softwares that have the billing and the calendaring and whatnot all together. Many softwares on the market, whether legacy or cloud-based, some are integrated, some are separate. So I'm sure you're familiar with quite a few of those. Now, like I said, today we're focusing on one area of law firm accounting. So what is law firm accounting? Why is that specifically different from just plain business accounting? Well, there are three components in law firm accounting. First is the business accounting, also known as the back office accounting, facility, payroll, paper, computers. These are items that are handled by each and every business. And you have your profit and loss, your balance sheet. That's standard business practice. So that's your general business accounting. But these next two factors are unique to law firms. Second is that matter cost accounting and income accounting. This can be billed in various ways. Hourly matters, flat fee matters, contingency cases. How are your payments received? Uh, that's also unique to law firms. Um, how are you tracking those costs, whether they're direct or indirect? How you're tracking that uh, invoice payment that comes into the firm and allocating those payments, that too is unique. But the third item here is fee advances, retainers, and also client escrow. And this, as we know, is completely unique to law firms. 
and there's a lot of compliance regulations in place, which is not an optional thing. It's something that's a requirement. Many other industries don't have to deal with that, uh, but in the legal industry, it's definitely something that requires a lot of focus. So that is the area where we will be focusing on today, specifically with trust IOLTA accounting. So that takes us to what exactly is trust accounting. Well, trust accounting is also known as escrow accounting or IOLTA accounting, and there are state requirements and compliance mandates that are really most important when handling trust accounts. The, book, the bookkeeping for these uh, both include how you keep your software records as well as your paper trails. For an operating account, the rules are very different. There are very few rules when handling your business account. Um, how you handle those records you have a lot of leeway, uh, but in terms of trust accounting, you need to make sure that both the software uh, records are complete, you have the proper reporting, but also the paper copies, copies of checks, deposit slips, reports, all of that is available as well. So let's cover the types of funds that are in trust, and we have a few items listed here. So this is what should be managed or can be managed in the trust account. You have settlement funds, which are most common in personal injury cases or real estate settlements, and you typically have uh, maybe one deposit or a few deposits, which then must be dispersed to one or more parties. Uh, and these are just funds that go in and then go back out, uh, disperse those third-party vendors or whoever the case may be. Second is unearned income. Your state may allow advances or retainers in the operating accounts as well, but you do need to follow your local guidelines properly because that does vary by state. In those cases, to a large degree, it depends on maybe the engagement that you have with your client, the retainer agreement, uh, and, and things of that nature. But normally, a good rule of thumb is if under any situation you may need to return the funds back to the client, maybe the case has ended, the case close maybe prematurely, then you might be better off using your trust account. So that unearned income is really about retainers. Um, they, they're called fee and cost advances as well. Uh, they a lot of times are handled in trust, but you do want to follow your local guidelines as I stated. Uh, you may also have advances for cost judgment funds, which is typical of contingency cases, and also third-party funds. So all of these types of uh, funds can be held in the trust account. It's not always 100% retainer and it's not always 100% um, you know, a judgment fund. It can be a mixture of multiple things sometimes. But that takes us to what type of funds do not belong in trust and this is very important to understand. You have personal funds. Really anything that is not client related does not belong in the trust account. In some cases, very nominal amounts of personal funds are allowed in the trust account to cover service or bank charges. And we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. Earned income, anything that is earned, whether it's from, uh, for your fees, you know, from a retainer or whatnot, it should be withdrawn and deposited into the business account. So while it might've been a retainer at one point in the trust, once it's earned, it should be taken out. Payroll. That's a big one. That's a business expense. It should never have any place in your trust account. And also any situation in which you're not the fiduciary trustee, you should not be managing those funds in a trust account. If you're not the one um, who's taking that responsibility, you shouldn't be holding on to it because you're, in essence, taking that responsibility by managing those funds. So it's very important to understand that this is the type of money that does not belong in a trust account. Let's talk about some accounting tools. Now, today, this usually falls under one of three categories. Manual, which includes written ledgers or spreadsheets, which is still very common, surprisingly enough. Uh, you also have generic accounting software, which is typical among many small businesses. And I know a lot of attorneys who use programs such as QuickBooks or similar applications because they're very common for business accounting. All right, very good. So um, to go further with that, I was talking about gener general accounting software, um, 
many businesses use that. So law firms, of course, many times are those small businesses. And uh, they go to that generic accounting software to solve their business and accounting issues. But there's also this third item, legal specialized accounting software. And this caters specifically to the unique needs of attorneys. So you do have these three options overall. Now let's talk about um, what makes trust accounting easy and also hard. So we start with the easy part. Well, believe it or not, many think trust accounting is just too big of a task, too difficult, but it's actually pretty straightforward. And these are some of the reasons why. There's no profit and loss to calculate, just money in and money out. Uh, it's not your business accounting, so you're not having to deal with uh, typical business reports. There's no depreciation. There's no depreciation. Sorry about that. There's no depreciation or amortization. There is no interest accumulation, even in an IOLTA account. Any interest that's deposited must be withdrawn almost instantly. There's no tax accounting, so you're not having to worry about uh, putting in taxes at end of year, end of quarter, anything like that, because it's not your earned income. And there's no account management in terms of fees or bank fees, as those amounts should always be deducted from your business account. And that's an important point. I do have many customers of ours who say that, oh, um, you know, I have this cushion in my trust account in case I have a bank fee or a wire fee. Well, technically, those fees should not come out of your trust account. They should only come out of your business account. But depending on the bank that you're working with, many of these large banks, believe it or not, do not follow trust accounting guidelines because they don't work for just attorneys. They work for many, many different businesses. So it's your responsibility to say to your bank or when looking for a bank, say, hey, I want to work for a bank or I want to have my money at a bank where you take these trust account guidelines into account and if I have a wire fee, that is deducted from my connected operating account and not my trust account. But again, it does vary. If you have a bank that doesn't work that way, you may need to have a cushion in your trust account. So do keep those factors in mind as well. So based on this list, you would think that this seems pretty easy. There's a lot of stuff you don't have to do, especially compared to a business account. There's a lot of things that you don't have to think about. Well, let's check take a look at the other side, which is why is trust accounting hard? You must track funds for each and every matter. The bank knows your total account balance, but you're responsible for knowing at all times what portion is for which matter. And that's something that you need to stay on top of. You must reconcile your books monthly. There's a lot of flexibility when it comes to the business account, since that's your own money. Um, you know, balancing your checkbook and whatnot, you have some liberties there. However, when managing client funds, monthly reconciliation is not only essential, it is a requirement. Uh, just think about not only is there human error, yourself or your staff could make a mistake, but banks make mistakes too. If you don't check that on a monthly basis, you could be overdrafting or commingling funds without even realizing it. So that does uh, need to be done on a regular basis. You must also maintain an audit trail for the exact same reasons. When dealing with your client's money, you must account for every action taken on that account and have a good record for it. So to make this a little bit easier, you do need an integrated system which can support the trust funds management along with your billing. That is a helpful factor to make sure that everything uh, is taken care of. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what goes wrong. So a few items that uh, can kind of, are actually very common to occur with trust accounting is items that are not, we're not talking about knowing misappropriations, which is theft. We're not talking about that, uh, you know, personal using of trust account. Actually a vast majority of disciplinary cases, over 95% are related just to poor record keeping and maybe compliance practices and just neglect. So we're not talking about intentional um, actions. That's a very different situation. But even in a case of negligence, there can be severe consequences as well. Um, but we're here today to learn about how you can prevent those types of mistakes to begin with. And as you can see here, the list is quite a bit long. Uh, there's quite a few items here. 
Not all of them may apply to you, but you still must be aware of each and every one. And we're going to walk through uh, each of these items and cover them in a little bit more detail. So the first item to talk about is lack of trust-specific knowledge and rules. As I mentioned before, each state does have its own compliance guidelines and audit programs, and you must be aware of them. Some states, uh, you'll only get audited if you get flagged from the bank or a client dispute. Some other states, like New Jersey, where we're located, there's a random audit program. So you want to be aware of the audit programs, their changes. Um, you know, they may just decide one day to make it a random audit program. You need to be aware of that. And also the compliance guidelines. If you are to get audited, what matters of compliance are you supposed to meet? Um, you need to be aware of that as well. Also be aware that most CPAs and bookkeepers understand operating accounting. Often they're not aware or care for the unique trust accounting challenges and also those compliance requirements unless they specialize in servicing law firms. So majority of the time, the customers that I deal with, they have a you know general CPA or bookkeeper that works for many types of businesses. If that is the case, you need to make sure that they are aware or at least willing to take the time to really understand trust accounting, how it should be managed, the compliance requirements for not only on a federal level, but state. You may have a bookkeeper in another state or a CPA in another state. So all those have to be taken into account. At the end of the day, it is your responsibility, not the accountants. So you want to make sure that the person that you're working with, if it is somebody outside your firm, has the necessary knowledge as well. You can't just expect hey, they're an accountant, of course they know this stuff. There are many legal specific factors that they may not. Secondly is specific to small firms. There are some challenges that arise just by having a smaller business. For any size firm, compliance requirements are the same. Of course, whether you're a solo or a hundred attorney firm, you always have to deal with compliance, um, whether it's with an audit, um, whatever the case may be in that. Your chances are typically the same. But there's other items that can be somewhat of a disadvantage, like maybe you lack certain dedicated resources in terms of, you know, some bigger firms have controllers and uh, CFOs who handle, you know, specifically going through the books and making sure everything looks okay. Not every firm has that resource. Having um, training in the office, you know, making sure that, Everything, all the processes are in place, everybody's following the same um, methods of how everything should be managed. Now, of course, small businesses can achieve that as well, but sometimes the resources, uh, the lack of resources can feed into that. And IT systems, um, how your office is set up it can be very different. You may be looking at five different tools that one person handles, which can be very cumbersome and very hard to manage. So. Most of the times, uh, in the smaller businesses especially, you're wearing many hats and trying to meet compliance just as easily as the larger counterparts, but they have very different resources, departments, teams to handle this type of thing. So though it can be seen as a shortcoming, the important thing out of this is everybody has the same likelihood of being audited and everybody has the same compliance requirements regardless. So there needs to be ways to overcome these various challenges, which we'll talk a little bit about. Our third item here is manual systems. So tracking client funds manually or on loose spreadsheets, as I mentioned before, is not only slow, but very, very prone to errors. Calculation errors are very common, uh, but even more importantly, they're hard to find and even harder to fix. So you may be chasing around a five cent discrepancy and wondering what's going on here. Um, and granted, there's some leeway, you know, certain discrepancies you can write off, but uh, for the most part, you really should account for every penny in a trust account. And once you find the mistake, then you got to recreate those records. That will take a lot of time. So though there's, there's flexibility, I have a lot of my customers say, oh, but you know, my Excel spreadsheet lets me do whatever I need to do. That's the problem you're able to do whatever you need to do. So there's no safeguards in place. There's no, there's nothing telling you, hey, you can't write that check, or hey, these funds are on hold, or hey, um, you put this under the wrong matter. 
There's nothing in the manual system to tell you that. So you need to make sure, not only with your ledger book, but also ma um, writing manual checks or deposit slips to be very, very careful or maybe look for an automated method of doing these things. If you're using a general accounting solution, make sure they're set up properly. These solutions, as I mentioned, are not designed for specifically legal practices. So you need to be extra vigilant and evaluate your tools carefully. Um, as I mentioned, programs like QuickBooks are great accounting tools for small businesses, but it's your responsibility to make sure that, okay, I'm not just a business, I'm also a law firm. I wanna make sure that I'm compliant with legal accounting and proper trust accounting. And that's, at the end of the day, your responsibility, and you need to make sure the program is set up in that way. Uh, and the last thing you want to find out is at the time of audit, your system can't produce those reports. You know, what if you're using a manual system or a general accounting system? Somebody knocks on your door and says, okay, I need um, five years worth of three-way reconciliation reports. And you're like, um, okay, how do I do those? And it's not one of those things that you just, okay, I can generate seven, go back and do seven reconciliation reports um, if you have a system that doesn't do that. So you don't want to be caught in that type of position either. Number four here is trust funds get commingled. So there are two types of commingling. First is losing track of client balances in your trust accounts, which basically means you don't have separate ledger cards. You should have a separate ledger card for each and every matter. If you lose track of that, and I have actually seen this where people come in to, uh, to use Cosmolex and they say, okay, great, I want to migrate my balances. And we say, okay, that's no problem. Um, you have you know, 500,000 in the trust account. What are the amounts for each matter? And they say, I have no idea. And that, that's a big problem because you're basically saying you don't know where your client's money is or what portion is there. So that that's something that you need to be very, very careful on, and that a lot of times just comes down to the tool that you're using. A second form of commingling is mixing of client funds with your own funds. Now, I did mention that you can have that separate cushion in some circumstances, but that is something to check into with your state. But it's a very small amount, and it's only what's allowed. You shouldn't be just putting in your own funds into trust to cover overdrafts or um, whatever the case may be, the commingling. You shouldn't just be throwing in extra funds without having a very good idea as to what portion of those funds is yours. So that too needs to be tracked almost like its own separate matter. Uh, you can keep different trust funds in one bank. Of course, you can have hundreds of clients uh, with funds in one bank account. That's perfectly fine, but they need to be separate on your books. So your bank is not responsible for separating those out for you, you are. In some unique situations, um, perhaps you have very large amounts of funds that need to stay in the bank for a while, you may wish to open a separate trust account just for one client. Um, that may happen in certain uh, real estate cases or very, very high value personal injury cases. And that's really up to you, uh, whatever's easiest to track those funds. But it might be, especially if disbursements are involved, if there is a high value amount, it might be easier just to track in a separate account. And whatever system you use must force you to manage your funds by matter. That's essential. That gets you away from all the commingling issues. It can't be something that is an afterthought that you go, oh, oops, I accidentally took money from this other client. Let me patch that up and fix it. That should not be your mentality when handling your trust account. That leads us actually a pretty good transition into our fifth item, which is trust ledger overdrafts. It is illegal to overdraw trust accounts at the matter level. And what I mean by that is Overdrawing the bank account, of course, is is a bit is an issue as well. But the bank is only going to tell you if you overdrafted completely on your bank account. They're not going to tell you, oh, hey, you only had three thousand dollars for this matter and you cut a check for four thousand. That they're not going to tell you. Even general accounting softwares won't tell you that either. So it's up to you to make sure that that is managed properly. Um, whether or not there's a balance in the check in the excuse me in the trust account to cover that check is not the point. You need to make sure that the funds are available for that client so you're not taking funds from somebody else. There are also many case laws where lawyers were disbarred 
even though funds were used for genuine purposes. But again, they weren't, maybe you received a deposit. That deposit hasn't cleared yet. You go to cut a check. Since that deposit hasn't cleared yet, you're technically taking that money from another matter. So you need to be aware of you know, how long it takes for deposits to clear, um, what the actual balance is in the system. All of that is something to be very aware of. And as I mentioned, I will demonstrate all of these different um, items in just a moment. Some common examples of here, absence of safeguards, is uh, fund commingling. So these are type of things that you need in place to prevent common trust mistakes. You need a commingling safeguard, preventing overdrafts, no duplicate check numbers, everything matter centric. Those are some examples of safeguards. Now, of course, in manual systems, you're not gonna have that whatsoever. In general accounting systems, some of these Possibly you could set up through a workaround method, but really legal specific trust accounting tools are what are going to give you these types of safeguards. Uh, because not only is it built for trust accounting specifically, but legal accounting as well. So as a business owner, I mentioned this earlier as well, you can't take the role of your CPA or bookkeeper. But so you can outsource those activities, it's very common, but you still have the fiduciary responsibility, which that can't be delegated. So no matter what your accountant does or bookkeeper does, at the end of the day, it's the responsibility of the firm. All right, so our next item here is uncleared funds that are not being addressed. Now this could be a big challenge. Most service businesses do not really care when their issue checks are cleared or not cleared. Um, us as a business, you know, it's not something that we lose sleep over for sure. However, when it comes to your trust account, as I mentioned, you have that responsibility till those funds are cleared. Uh, that goes both ways. When you're waiting for that deposit to clear or if you're cutting a check and that check is out to being dispersed to a third party and let's say it gets lost in the mail or something occurs and it never gets cashed, you're responsible for that. Um, and the longer it goes uncleared, the harder it is to figure out um, what to do with it. So monthly reconciliations and the reports that come with that are what really help to keep an eye on this month to month. You should be aware each and every month what's not cleared. Of course, it's normal to have uncleared items each month, but if something carries over month to month to month to month, something's wrong. And you should be able to get that red flag much sooner as opposed to possibly a year later, a client saying, oh, by the way, I never got that check. Then what do you do? So the monthly reconciliations can definitely uh, take care of that. Our next item is in regards to bank reconciliation. So that, as uh, I mentioned actually previously with, with the point before, it's always important to reconcile. I mean, it's always good to, like they say in the past, balance your checkbook, make sure everything works out, everything zeroes out. But with trust accounting, it is absolutely critical. It is not a option. It's something that has to be done. You can guarantee if you don't reconcile that there's gonna be a big, big mess awaiting you because there are mistakes, they happen. You can't say mistakes don't happen. And when you do monthly reconciliations, you catch them very quickly, able to fix them so that the next month, everything moves smoothly. If a mistake happened even a year ago, you're gonna to have to clean up a year's worth of mess possibly. So um, we did mention a little bit how trust reconciliation is different from operating accounts. You do need to perform for trust what's known as a three-way bank reconciliation each and every month. And this type of reconciliation breaks down your book balance, your bank balance, but a third item, which is the individual ledger card balances. All three of those must match. That's the three-way check. So not only does this help come audit time, but each month you'll quickly discover if there's any mistakes and be able to fix them right away. This type of reporting is not available in general accounting softwares. Uh, you may be able to, some consultants put together, uh, you know, a report that kind of takes three different reports and combines them together. That can be done, but in terms of having this 
report readily available to you, that is a legal specific, and it has to be with a program, obviously, that has fully built in trust accounting in order to accomplish that. Our next item is dealing with separate billing and accounting systems. Now, for most firms, billing and trust and business accounting are very much interdependent, and they need to rely on each other. Uh, everything needs to work well together. And for a few firms, maybe trust is more prominent, maybe some, firm, some firms billing is more prominent, that does vary by firm, but all together, these three things need to work very tightly together. It is critical to really understand why that is the case. Well, a few examples are the trust fund balance needs to be visible on your invoices. Um, if you're billing to a client and you have some client funds of theirs, you need to make it known how much that is. Um, the, also, when you're debiting from a trust account to pay an invoice, Many things need to occur. You need to debit the trust account, credit the operating account, update the ledger card balance, update the bank balances, mark the invoices paid. There's a lot that takes place. And when you're doing that in two separate systems, a lot could go wrong. A lot of mistakes can happen, not only the fact that it's time consuming, but uh, that's something to really uh, take into consideration. So there are many advantages to integrating all those items within your billing process um, into one system. So the billing and accounting together, they work, I mean, whenever you're receiving funds, accounting happens. So whether it's trust accounting or business accounting. So billing is all about getting paid. So they all three really closely interrelate with each other. Our last item here uh, deals with controls and data protection. So whatever tool you use, it needs to contain user level access controls so that you can designate who can do and see what. This is very important. You may have some staff that's mainly billing or mainly time entry. You don't want them to see your trust account balance. Um, you want them to, or you may have a bookkeeper that you only want to do reconciliation or printing checks. You don't want them to see your invoices. There may be many scenarios, but you need to be able to have that flexibility to say, okay, you can do and see this, but you can only do and see that. Audit logs. With using a software solution, a log can easily be kept showing who has done what. That's one of the great advantages to using a software in terms of, you know, in comparison to manual systems because you could see exactly who did what when. And that's essential in, you know, throughout the entire practice, but trust accounting especially. If something got overdrafted, you could see what transaction was done by who and not only does it give accountability to your firm and your staff to let them know, hey, I'm keeping an eye on these things, but it does allow for, um, you know, you to, to kind of backtrack and see how to fix certain mistakes. And of course, backups. Um, copying from one machine to another or using a zip drive, that is not backup. Um, it is easy to copy the wrong way, lose a bunch of work. I know many people that put their backups in the same area as their computer. So God forbid, you know, there was a flood or something happened, it got stolen, your backup's gone, gone as well. So uh, you want to make sure that everything is covered, um, everything is backed up and secure. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the records that are needed for trust accounting. So especially with trust accounting, which I emphasized earlier, proper reporting and recording is a necessity. It's how you're keeping up your books is only as good as the reports that you can give an auditor or somebody in a client dispute scenario. Especially with trust accounting, um, you will need retention of these records for up to seven years. Now, an audit could say anywhere from I want the last six months to I want the last seven years. So um, that is the time frame. And apart from these reports, you need physical copy of actual instruments, meaning business slip, um, excuse me, deposit slips, cancel checks paper statements, that is required as well. Um, now I have generated a copy of each of these reports from the Cosmic software, so we'll quickly go through each of these records and kind of just explain the importance of them. Your bank ledger, um, this is your receipts and your disbursements. All of your entries are here, including your voids, all the information in terms of date, who, 
who was the payee, amounts, purpose, client, running balance. This is really your all-in-one view on the bank level of what occurred, but it also gives that matter association. You also break that down into two other reports, receipts journal, which is purely your deposits. So this will list out all of the deposits, but again, notice that there is a client matter link to everything. That is important. You can't just say, oh, there was a thousand dollar deposit. Well, who was that for? You don't know? Well, your bank can tell you that there was a thousand dollar deposit, but as to what matter it's related to, that's what you need your individual tools for. So you have the same for your disbursements. You need a disbursement journal that will list all of your checks so that you know exactly what happened. Now, the reason why these reports are important is many times auditors will ask for them, these specific items. Client funds need to be separate. This is the ledger card balance report. So this is a very critical report, and this provides the balance for each of the clients in your books. But there's also some checks that may be in transit that haven't hit the bank yet. So until those funds are cleared from the bank, you're still in possession and still responsible. So this report actually lets you know balances for the matter, but what's cleared and what's uncleared. So you have a very good idea of what's actually in the bank and what's soon going to be in the bank. And then you have your individual client ledger cards. So this is the mini bank account statement for the ledger. Um, that is really your guide for that particular matter. Um, there's a running balance as well. So if there is an overdraft, an auditor or whoever looking at this report would see it very quickly, and that's what they look for. So having a tool in place that doesn't allow that is very important as well. I won't get into too much about reconciliations. I talked about that pretty much in depth, um, but in regards to uh, making sure it's done monthly, it's really clearing the items that have cleared the bank, catching those mistakes, rectifying them if need be, and that spits out two additional reports. Your reconciliation report, which is a listing of all of your cleared and unclear transactions from the month, and that three-way reconciliation report that I discussed. It's the book balance, the bank balance, and all the client ledger balances that will be compared, matched, and good to go. That's that three-way check. So that is uh, all the reporting. Uh, very quickly, it won't take too long, I'm going to give uh, a couple of examples of the items that I talked about, because I think it's important to have a visual as to what we're referring to when we say certain things. So for instance, um, right now I'm in the Cosmic software, we talk about having your funds separated out, um, not commingling, not having any mixture. And because this is a legal specific software, you can do certain things, such as, here I can see very clearly what my client funds are for a particular matter, all the way down the line. Now I have my overall trust balance somewhere under the bank, but the most important thing here is knowing the individual uh, client balances as well. I have this trust transaction button. Now this allows me to do various activities. I can do checks, deposits, wires, adjustments. This is all that flexibility you wanna have in a trust accounting system, and you can also cut checks and print checks. Uh, of course, disbursements are a necessity with any trust account. Um, now this particular matter, I'm just going to reference it really quickly. Uh, this particular matter has an individual client balance and we mentioned overdrafts. You can't overdraft or you shouldn't be able to overdraft. Here I have just over $3,300 for this client. I have a large amount in the trust account, um, but I'm going to just cut a $4,000 check. I'm not looking at the balance. I'm gonna say, you know what? This particular vendor told me they need a $4,000 check. It's an expense that you know has to be covered. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut this check. Sure, no problem. I'm prevented from doing that. And then you think, oh wait, do I not have those funds? And then you go and check and say, oh, I don't. So I need to reach out to the client, get more funds, and then cut this check. So this saves a lot a lot of headaches because this wouldn't be found unless you were looking at specific reports because a reconciliation won't even tell you this because a reconciliation only cares what's in the bank really. Um, that's very hard to find when using manual or general accounting systems. 
Uh, next is applying a trust retainer to an invoice. You'll notice here that I have, um, for the same matter, I have just over that $3,300 retainer, and my unpaid amount is green, telling me that I have funds to pay those invoices, which also is very useful. That's where the trust accounting and the billing really cross over. So if I go within this matter, and I say, okay, um, I want to pay this particular invoice. So I'm going to pay it from trust funds. And I'm going to, let's say I'll, I'll pay both of these invoices. So it was, the total was 960750 And I'm going to cut a check. And it's going to be for these two items. And I'm going to go ahead and receive payment. In that one step, as I mentioned before, I have now paid that invoice, it's marked as paid. I have money out of trust, so that check will be cut out of trust. I already have it waiting for me. A deposit into the operating, all the retainers, you notice, were updated. Here, this was reduced. My unpaid amount was corrected as well, and all my bank balances were corrected. It seems like a very simple operation, what I just did, but a lot happens all at the same time, and really the benefit is by having the billing and the trust accounting together. Reconciliation. There are many applications that I've seen that say we have fully built in trust accounting, but you need to use an accounting software to reconcile. And that really should be unacceptable. Um, you want to make sure that everywhere from your um, matter being set up to receiving those funds to cutting those checks to reconciling to reporting is all in one area because the second it's somewhere else you don't get a full picture and it's a lot easier to make mistakes a lot easier to miss things um, and not know you know what data is where so here everything I've done is already in the system I could say hey this is cleared or uncleared very easily and get that done regularly uh, we even have the ability to import your bank statements to do an auto reconciliation. The main reason for that is the easier it is, the more likely it is to be done. So we want to encourage this to be done on a regular basis each and every month. And then that, of course, leads to the reports. I mean, I went through all of the uh, reports prior, but just to see here, this is where you have your reconciliation report, your three-way report, and also all of your ledger reports as well. So you want to make sure that those items, especially the ones that will be needed, come audit time. It's like an insurance policy. You want to have all those reports easily accessible to say somebody knocked on your door tomorrow and said you're going to be audited. Have those ready. Don't go through a mess like so many firms I know where they need to put their business on hold, they need to hire a forensic accountant, they need to get everything together. They give you two weeks, but many times they need to ask for an extension, and it can become a really big mess. So this is your insurance policy, ensuring that, hey, um, if I need, if somebody were to knock on my door next week, I'm well prepared and ready for it. And I can even go back to previous months and, and take out whatever reports that they need. So that's just a quick overview from a software standpoint. It's very simple, um, as you can see. It's money in, money out, following up every month, doing your reporting, but it's something that needs a little bit of um, discipline, has to be done on a regular basis and taken care of. So let's just cover quickly uh, what we've learned, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up uh, the webinar with some questions and also talk about the upcoming uh, parts of this three-part series. So we've learned today understanding trust accounting and its many components, top 10 pitfalls, uh, along with the proper trust account records, what re reports are most necessary, and how tools can help in terms of not just automating, but providing the necessary safeguards to make sure everything is managed properly. Some next steps. Identify if any of these issues exist in your practice. Ensure that proper reports are being filed and maintained and research and implement a tool to ensure proper compliance going forward. So if everything's going well in your firm and you're following these safeguards and you have these practices in place, that is excellent. If for whatever reason you do not and you're noticing some holes in your process in terms of managing your trust account, the important part is identifying what may be going wrong and how those can be prevented. 
And just as an overview, this is everything that Cosmlex does have to offer. Today's focus, of course, was on trust accounting. So we do have that fully built in trust accounting, along with the other areas to maintain your practice. Legal billing, business accounting, but also calendar tasks, documents, and emails as well. So all of these interrelate, they all cross over. Uh, today was a very big focus on trust and how it can interrelate with billing and also accounting as well. So um, this is everything available in one login from Cosmolex. So the Legal Accounting Webinar Series, what is upcoming? So of course today was session one, trust accounting specifically. On October 20th, we'll have session two, which is on credit card accounting. Um, accepting credit cards in a business is a great convenience, but there's other factors that come along with that. So that's a very interesting topic. On October 27th, session number three, business accounting. Um, and we talked a little bit about how legal accounting is a bit different. So this will go into more detail on that. So you're more than welcome to register right on our main website. The link is provided there. Uh, and you can register for our two follow-up webinars as well. And I'll give you a nice big picture on legal accounting and how to prepare yourself for 2017.